Hello and welcome to the 40 Athletes Podcast. But before we get started, be sure to sign up for our free five-day demo course that shows 12 to 18-year-olds the power of a positive attitude. The link is in the description below. Click on it where you'll find tips and strategies to help your child have a better sports experience and develop a more positive attitude. Now, let's begin with episode 74 of the 40 Athletes Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode number 74 of the 40 Athletes Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jason Holzer, along with my good buddy, Jimmy Huber. Jimmy, good morning to you. Good morning to you, Jason. You know, it's a uh, cloudy, rainy day today, but our guest today, though, is it's very, you know, she should she bring the sunshine today with just her personality, you know, her spirituality, um, and she's a holistic performance coach. And we were talking about holistic approach to sports. So that's why I decided to bring Jonah Genova on today because she's going to dive into how the spiritual side of sports. Well, you, you got me excited when I saw it's like she's got focus and flow integration. And I know when you get the cloudy days, you get stuff going on, you get distracted, you're unfocused all over the place. So how do I get in focus and how do I flow? Yeah. It's that flow state, right? So I'm excited to learn this today. Well, and some of her work has been featured in Good Morning America, Los Angeles Times, Women's Health Magazine. You know, she works with NFL players, coaches to help them find peace, calm, and positivity. And I know myself could use a lot more of that in my life as well. You could always be more calm, more peaceful, and more positive, you know. so hey, My sons would be excited to listen to her since you said she works with NFL players. With the NFL draft tonight, they're like, yeah. NFL, oh my gosh, she's, who's she working with? Pat Mahomes? Is she working with what? Travis Kelsey? Uh, who's she working with? Matthew Stafford? Yeah, they get excited about that. Yeah. Well, whatever it takes for them to learn, you know, other skills besides sports skills. Right. So, well, we're going to bring her on. Uh, Jonah, good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. I know it's early in L.A., so thank you for for getting up and, and joining us this morning. Sure thing. Happy to be here. Yeah. So how did you uh, how did you get into the holistic performance coaching? Like, you know, what's your what's your uh, drive behind that? What made you feel like there was a need for it? Um, can you just give us a little bit of a backstory on you know, what got you to the point where you're at today? Sure. Um, I can give you the long story or the short story. I'll try to make it the shorter version. Um, the title holistic performance coach is something that just sort of came to me and evolved over time based on the work that I was doing. So I was teaching meditation, but in a way that's different than a lot of meditation teachers, because I had taken a traditional approach within the Tibetan tradition. So when I was in college, um, someone who happened to be one of my favorite professors was also a Tibetan Lama, and I did not know that. And I began a study of Tibetan Buddhism back then, and also a personal practice through working with him. And he has been my mentor now for, uh, I don't know, 23 years or something like that. And so through this like traditional approach, we don't do like a certification program. Like we don't set out to be a meditation teacher. Rather, we begin a personal practice. And then after a period of time, if the teacher or the, the guru, I know that word kind of scares people, but um, I can explain more about that in a second. If they sort of recognize us as being a teacher, having a level of stabilization in the practices, then we receive an authorization to teach. And so with that kind of a path, um, the teacher is better equipped to like hold a space and be a gentle guide for the person who's learning meditation. And it's more about like um, the whole person rather than like pressing buttons in the brain, which is how I see a lot of mindfulness practices actually. And my prior to meeting this professor, I had done brain research, um, working with, I had another lucky opportunity to work directly with a professor and we were doing some of the earliest brain mapping research on pain in the mid nineties. And so I saw for myself that our thoughts can directly impact our neural response to pain. And I was about 18 years old in a laboratory and there was a group also in Australia working on similar research, but it takes a really long time for that kind of research to even make it into scientific publications and then to like the medical field. So I was like walking through life as a, you know, adolescent basically with this view of things that was really different than a lot of other people. I understood or believed a mind body connection 
long before people were talking about it, let alone believed in it. Um, and then I also had this um, window into Tibetan culture. And in college, I was pre-med. And I began to notice these differences between how Tibetans approach death and how like Western medicine approaches death or what it means to be well and healthy. And I, it, it occurred to me, I was like, oh my goodness, like there's a cultural bias in medicine. And this, I didn't have the word bias yet. Like people weren't really using that kind of language, but I could see that it was culturally influenced. And whereas the Tibetans do a lot of work to prepare for death, knowing that our bodies are deteriorating as we age. It's just a natural part of life. In the U.S., I saw us looking for ways to keep the body running for as long as possible and that that was a measure of health. But the dependents say, like, look, you're, everyone's going to die. Like, that's just how it is. So what makes for a healthy life? And they have a list of other things that makes for a healthy life. So here I am going about my life doing these things. And I worked in finance and then I was an entrepreneur for a while. And then I began teaching meditation. And um, I don't know, eight or so years into teaching meditation, an NFL player came to one of my classes. I did not know he was an NFL player. And one thing led to the next. And here I am working directly with players and coaches um, uh, across the country. Um, and so for a long time, I got by just being Jana or Jana, the meditation teacher. And also, I didn't really talk about this, but um, I'm also a natural healer and I have kind of a healing presence. And I had a whole company doing energy healing services in um, residential and outpatient treatment centers for mental health and substance use disorders, people who had experienced a lot of trauma. So I like had these like multiple titles, you know, like, um, like part scientist, part meditation teacher, part healer. And it was getting really like confusing. And I have a unique name. So I got by just being Jonna for a while. And then folks were like, look, we need a title for you. So I was working with my performance coach. I'm like, I don't know what to call this. Like, I don't know anyone else that's doing what I'm doing. I can't explain really what I'm doing because it's so many things coming together at once. Um, and we said it was kind of like performance coaching, um, but it's not exactly what other performance coaches are doing. You care about the whole person, but not just the whole person, the relationships in their life, the relationship to their work, the relationship to family, friends, teammates, and, and so on. So we came up with holistic performance coach, and that's that's where I am today. Yeah. Hey, Johnny, you you mentioned quite a bit that we can dive into. Yeah. One thing I'd yeah. like to <laughs> go back to what you mentioned is the thoughts that we have. And they talk about thoughts become things, right? Yeah. And you mentioned this mind body connection. Can you like if you're working with say a client or somebody that's like you know I, I'm really struggling, maybe it's fear, anxiety, depression, and and I have all these thoughts going on. How do you get them to really think about their thoughts? Maybe to shift those that allow them to maybe feel differently, that they start acting differently, maybe their be, body behaves differently. Thanks, Jimmy, for that question because I think that's something a lot of people are interested in. And they come to me like for that because they recognize that they're having unhelpful thoughts, right? And because of, I think it's because of kind of my intuitive, sensitive, healing nature. Um, I, generally, I have an ability to sense into like the deeper reason for those thoughts. And so when I'm working directly with someone, I prefer why not get to like the heart of the issue, clear up the heart of the issue and then we've really healed this um the problem that's manifesting in your life because of the underlying issue and so there's like a couple ways to go about it a lot of people in like contemporary psychology work with methods of like replacing a negative thought with a positive thought and trying to train the brain in that way and for me for really, in, in my personal experience, like me as an individual and also the many clients that I've worked with who have complex lives or complex underlying trauma, sometimes the underlying like reason is really persistent. Like it's a thing that wants to be known for our fuller personhood, like our, our big picture in this lifetime. And so I prefer to go to that like deeper work, that thing that wants to be heard, it's going to be heard in some way. We can squash down the thoughts, but I think it'll come out in our physical body in some way, 
or through emotions. Like it's something that needs to be addressed. So um, my approach with this is informed by both like the Tibetan practices, but also kind of like energy healing work. And with Tibetan practices, they're, they're like very fearless people. I mean, we sometimes we think of Buddhists as being like docile and always calm, but the Tibetans um, historically are like fearless warriors. In fact, mm. that's why they were given these practices to keep safe while wars were going on. So they were taught these practices and then they happened to be really good at them. So um, there's a, a fearlessness and a courageousness where with the help of someone else, because it's um, important to know that we are like always like safe and we could say like in relationship or in community, then we welcome whatever is here. And there are like meditation practices to do this. We welcome whatever the feelings are, whatever the thoughts are, and we hold them in a compassionate way. Almost like if a friend came to you with a problem, we wouldn't tell the friend, oh, don't have that thought, have this thought instead. We would listen to them, right? And we would hold like, it's like, imagine what that's like. You, you've got this good friend, like Jason, Jimmy comes to you. Jimmy doesn't complain very often. And so when he comes to you, you know, it's serious. And so what would you do? Like, you know, you would drop everything and you would look into his eyes and you would like be fully present to him and be curious what's going on. Like, oh, you know, I didn't know that was happening for you. And tell me more, right? Like that kind of posture. And I believe, I don't just believe in my experience, if we do this in like in the right way, in a skillful way, then what happens is the thing that needs to be heard and addressed is heard. And that's really all it wants. It just like wants to be acknowledged, almost like a little kid that is like, you know, screaming for mommy and daddy. And then you turn and you say, okay, what? And then they, they're quiet, you know? Our feelings are just like this and our feelings are closely tied to our thoughts. Um, so when we talk about um, like uh, difficult thoughts that we're having or limiting beliefs about ourselves, oftentimes there's an, a feeling or an emotion associated with it, right? So letting it be here is often like the medicine for it to self-release. So um, like that's one way in. And then I call that process um, a process of an unlayering. Like we have all in our lifetimes accumulated limiting beliefs about ourselves and about the world. And so if we engage in this practice on like a regular basis, then we are continuously unlayering, peeling away those layers that are not true about us and about others. And um, if we do that regularly, it's almost like good hygiene, you know, then, then we rest in what's really here, what, what's really true. And I believe what's really true is um, a limitless capacity within each human being. Well, and, and Jonah, to go a little bit deeper on that, like, you know, Western yeah. medicine tends to focus on the symptoms and, and fix the symptoms, but it, we don't get to the deep root cause of things, right? And from what I hear you yeah. saying is, Allowing your emotions to just to to acknowledge them, that's that's part of that deep work of like getting to the root of why do I feel the way I feel? And most people don't aren't willing to go there. So how do we help people like get to the deep root of the cause to dig out some of those those traumas, those things that have maybe been layered deep for decades or you know for years to really like help us become more emotionally healthy, more emotionally well and that way we can get to a place of positive thoughts stick with us longer and we can feel the positive thoughts. Cause like you said, you can have positive mm -hmm. thoughts all day long, but if you're not emotionally connected with them, they're just going to stay up here. Right. So like that reversal yeah. process of, of getting to where we actually feel the positive thoughts that we want to have. Yeah, Jason, I totally agree. Like I kind of get a little like uh, angry when I hear people talk about like this whole, like, I mean, some people call it like toxic pos positivity, but like just like this being a positive state. But for me, if I don't truly believe it, it's almost evoking the counter thought, the thing I really believe, right? Like, um, I don't know, a lot of people struggle with like the way that they look or something. And so if you stand in the mirror and you say, I am beautiful, what's in the back of my mind is no, you're not. No, you're not. Mm -hmm. You know? And so it's just reinforcing that no, you're not by every time I say this to try to pretend and say this other thing, right? So another way to, to kind of like get there is to know the truth. And so I think that there's a fear, a cultural, it's this cultural fear. It's not a human fear to know that this is a cultural fear that's been 
We've been conditioned into this to believe that if we let in that scary thought or that scary feeling, that it's like a tidal wave that will overcome us. And that's mm. the only thing that's there. And this is a, like a everyone I've, I've encountered has this belief in, in the United States. In Tibet, no, like it's completely different. They're, they're not afraid at all. They have this idea of impermanence, that things are always changing. Mm -hmm. But in the US here, we think that this emotion of like fear or insecurity, if we let it in, that it's going to grow so big, it's going to take over our whole lives. So the first thing to know is that's not true. And the reason why we know it's not true is because we can see that it's a cultural belief. Not every human being has this. And also to trust in people who have already traveled that path that they made it through. So we can look to them for the evidence. And so like kind of knowing that, then we can have this willingness, this courageousness, like, okay, yeah, that's doable. And that's going to get me to where I want to be. And then we do it with the safety of someone who like knows how to guide us through that. Um, and it, depending on the level of what you're going through, it might have to be some, um, some deep trauma work. Um, and some, and I find a lot of athletes are afraid of that. They're like, no, I have business to do. I don't want to. And, you know, people within leagues don't want their athletes focusing on this stuff because they're afraid it's going to mess up their game. But I've never yeah. seen that happen. It's really, it's just a burden that athlete has been carrying. So it's like taking the weight vest off and letting them do their thing without the weight vest eventually. Yeah. yeah. I, I think for me too, this is something that if you talk to me about eight, 10 years ago about energy and healing or whatever, I'd be like, well, what, what are you, oh, woo -woo, this is, what are you talking about? But the more I've started raising my level of awareness to understand, like I've always grown up looking at my physical body. That's who I am. Like, I just see myself in this physical body. Right. And I started realizing like, oh no, I'm the spiritual being, right? I live in this physical body, the house I live in. And I'm blessed with this incredible mind, but it's been conditioned genetically and environmentally. And I have, all these negative maybe conditions that are going on and you talk about like energy. I'm like energy. They talk about flowing energies flowing to and through us, but sometimes we block it. And sometimes we're, we block this energy, right? Um, can you talk about like the energy part of it and as maybe how we're blocking energy um, as we're just beings and seeing this physical body and how you work with them on healing some of that energy um, blockage maybe that they have and some of the scars from the past? Yeah. Um, yes. So first I would say everything is energy, right? Like we look like solid beings. This table in front of me appears to be solid to me, but actually it's a bunch of like molecules, right? And then when we look closer, it's just essentially vibration, but it's like densely packed molecules, right? And then the air around us is, it doesn't look solid. So that's more loosely packed molecules. And then things like emotions are maybe somewhere in between. Like we can sense them and feel them, but we can't see them and necessarily like grab them or touch them. Like we could grab and touch the table. So kind of knowing that and like if we step back a little bit from that picture, some people like myself, the whole world, like I'm so like sensitive to energy. That is really easy for me to grasp that like it, this is all just a bunch of moving molecules and some are more closely packed than others. And for other people, and I, I think that everyone falls on a sensitivity spectrum, this is kind of a theory I've come up with. So there's not like good or bad as I'm describing this. I don't want you to think like one is better than the other. We're just all made differently. Um, some people just aren't as sensitive or aware of that. So it's harder to grasp. But what we can think, if, if we fall on that like end of the spectrum, something that you can think about is like this concept that you brought up, Jimmy, like, like what is, what am I beyond my physical body? Or what, what is like the spiritual part of me? What is my connection that I feel that's beyond my physical body? Like sometimes, you know, we have like an out, out of body experience almost where we forget we're in a body that often happens when we're in deep relationship with somebody and like maybe having a really meaningful conversation or when we're in nature or with like an animal and you like, you forget that you're in a body because you're having this higher level of experience. So that energy, um, we are permeable to all this energy that's flowing around us. Do you know that word permeable? Like, yeah, it's like, right? it's, it's yeah. through like both ways. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Both ways. So I got thinking as I was working with more and more people, I was like, gosh, I didn't know I was, you know, like where I fell on this level of sensitivity compared to other people. I was just having my own experience. But then when I started doing work with a lot of people, I started to think of it in this way. Like some of us are just more porous to the energy that's around us. So there's more in and outflow to everything that's happening. And some people are more closed than others. So the flow doesn't happen as freely back and forth. And finding like a happy medium between the two, I think is where we want to be, where we can let in what we want to let in and we are closed off when it's appropriate to be closed off. So someone like myself, who's incredibly open, there's a difficulty in like walking around the grocery store and picking up on people's moods. And some people would even say, maybe even picking up on their disease, because some people, many people believe that thoughts can actually lead to disease in the body. So a lot of people who are highly empathic end up having a lot of health problems because of this probably. So for someone like me, I want to work on my permeability, like closing up a little before I go out into the world so that I'm not just picking up on everything that's here. And for others who maybe have an issue with people saying like, you don't understand anything I'm saying, you're selfish, you know, people who are not so empathetic, then they might want to do some exercises to work on like opening up. And some, sometimes people are very closed off because bad things have happened to them. And they're like, look, I just can't handle anymore. Right. So that, that might be a healing path. I find a correlation between people who are highly sensitive and also high achievers or high performers. And I think that's really interesting because if we think about what it took for that individual to get this to this high level of whatever they're doing, let's say they're like an inventor of some kind, they're a musician, they're an athlete, they're tapping into more that's happening than the rest of us. And that extra like information is helping them to do their job in a unique way to get to another level. So when I think about the athletes that I work with, they are aware of everything happening on the entire field. Somehow, it's like a sixth, seventh, eighth sense. I don't know, right? It's like another level. So there's also a challenge for people who are highly sensitive in that way, like to their environment, because they might also be highly sensitive to other things, like subtle uh, judgment. And this can really mess up the mind of an athlete or a high achiever, right? So working in this realm of sensitivity is actually really helpful for people who are at that high, high level of, of performance um, for that reason. I mean, I think it's helpful for everybody, but that's, I, I think, how it can help high achievers. Yeah, when you, when you talked earlier and you think about athletes and you work with a lot of people within sports and, you know, the, some of them struggle with confidence, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Some of them, you know, you talk about they, they might be confident, but all of a sudden they go through a patch that they're struggling and they lose the confidence. Maybe their self-image lowers or whatever it is. Um, and you mentioned earlier about like this fearless warrior, right? How do you work with individuals that maybe say, I don't have confidence right now. I'm fearful to go out and compete. Um, the stress of everything around me. How do you get them reset back to maybe establish more of this confidence, but be this like fearless warrior when they're going out and competing? To be honest, most of the people I work with, so it's men, right, in the NFL, and um, they don't admit that they're not confident. They, they like, they won't, um, but then I'll, I'll find out later, like through deeper convers, like maybe down the road, they'll say, boy, I was really lacking confidence and you helped me with that. So I say that just as like a, um, an awareness opportunity for people who love athletes or are around them. Like they might not always admit when they're not feeling confident and It could be because of like wanting to be in that positive mindset. It could be a little bit of denial just for survival, like a helpful kind of thing. Um, But the person might not always say clearly, like I'm, I'm really lacking confidence. Who's at that level. Maybe someone who's at a different level has more freedom to, to admit that, to say that openly. Um, So the first thing I would do in working with anyone is just to be sensitive to like, what do I feel is happening for this person? Like, how does this person show up to me? And to trust that um, that sense about things, right? Like to think about them more than an athlete, to think about them as a human being and the way that you would be sensitive maybe to your child. Like 
what, what do I feel is going on here? And then, and then we look at, based on that, you could maybe ask some questions based on what you feel. And just like, hey, like what's going on for you lately? Or how are you feeling? And leave a lot of space for the person to talk about it. And then we address the underlying issue that's causing the lack of confidence rather than directly saying, oh, you're not feeling so confident. Let's work on your confidence. Because I think that that really direct approach like that is almost too harsh for difficult feelings. It's like difficult, like our, our scariest feelings that we could possibly have. And I think for an athlete, it could be lack of confidence. It's almost like whack-a-mole, that game. They, like they, they don't want to be seen, right? Mm -hmm. So they are not going to pop up. They're going to suck down right away. As soon as like they think someone sees them, they're going to retract and go away. And then we don't have a shot at helping to heal the thing, right? So I think a really like taking a, a the holistic approach, you know, like zooming out and looking at the whole person and providing some tenderness for what's here to reveal itself in its own time and often in its own way. When you go back to, you know, like kind of what you mentioned earlier about the importance of facing tough emotions, facing you know fears and not running from them, because what I found in my own life, the more I run away from feelings of uncomfortability or, or hard emotions, the worse they get over time and the more they tend to fester within, they come out in behaviors, you know, maybe it's reactions like mm -hmm. that kind of thing, you know? So how do you help people like face the toughest emotions so that way they don't, you know, manifest into bigger things later by running from them. It's almost like I've compared it to a shadow before. If you turn around, your shadow disappears when you face it, but the more you run from your shadow, mm -hmm. the bigger it gets. So how do you, how do you face those tough emotions like really work through the, the, I don't know, the grittiness of it, if you will, the, and, and really get to the other side of like relief. It's almost like a hard workout where like, you know, I got to get through this, you know, this bench press. It's tough, but I always, I always feel great on the other side, like getting just through it. How do we help them get through those emotions? Yeah. So the Tibetan meditation practices, um, and I would direct people who are curious about it. Um, so that professor of mine from college, his name is John McCransky. And he adapted Tibetan practices for Western um, people. And it could be um, people of like any faith, of no faith, of, uh, of Buddhist faith who want to deepen in their Buddhist practices. And he calls that whole system sustainable compassion training. So if you Google sustainable compassion training, you'll see um, his website and also some of the work of another um, friend, colleague, Paul Condon, who's a behavioral psychologist who does a lot of writing with John on like what's happening in these practices for us. So th that's a framework. I wish I had an easy, like do this and like easy hack, but those easy hacks are temporary. They're like band-aids and there's a lot of those floating around. And if they worked, we wouldn't be asking these questions anymore. So I'm offering kind of a, like a deeper thing that has actually worked for people for thousands of years. And it's really not that hard. So within sustainable compassion training, there are three modes. And the first mode is, re we call it like receiving care, receiving practice. And I can kind of talk you through this. Anyone could do this. You recall a moment of like caring connection. And I have a dog I love. Um, at times in my life, I've thought people really are awful. Don't trust people so much at times. So for me to think about like my dogs that I've had in my life or like if you've had a cat or a fish or whatever, I think that's a really nice way in. And just thinking about a time being with this loving creature, um, maybe looking into their eyes and feeling their fur and or maybe imagining the way they like run up to you when you come home and noticing the feelings that are in that moment as we recall that moment, like as if that moment were happening right now and just noticing like, gosh, I feel um, unconditional love right now. I feel excitement, like they're so excited to see me. I feel peace and calmness, like petting them. I feel this kind of like mutual love. I feel this uh, trust in this moment. And we explore what feelings are there and we marinate in the feelings that are there. And what's happening is we are like maybe remembering is a way we could say it, what's really here. And it's like uh, increasing those qualities within us. When I said 
that there are these like limiting beliefs and there's this process of unlayering. The unlayering is to reveal what's really here. And what's really here are those qualities in that caring moment, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if we learn to receive this moment, then whatever is on our mind at the time or coming up in our body, like emotions that are here, they start to heal under the like radiance of this moment that we're calling these qualities. So there's a lot happening in here, but it's getting us to the place you're talking about. So that's like the Buddhist side. And now I can talk to you a little bit about something called um, the theory of constructive emotion, if you're interested. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So another really influential person in my life uh, was another professor. Her name is Lisa Feldman Barrett. And I took a class with her when she was new at uh, Boston College where I went to school. And she has since gone on to be one of the most quoted neuroscientists like ever. And largely because of this this theory of hers, um, the theory of constructed emotion. And what she says or has proven in laboratories is that we can think of our brain as just like a dark box sitting on our body, right? Like the brain really can't see everything that's happening out around us. It depends on our body to send it information about what's happening here. And so our body is like sensing into what's going on. And the sense or like feelings, things like tingling that we might feel in our body, warmth, coolness, like certain vibes. There's a word for that. It's called interoception. So it's just like what we're sensing from our body. And then the brain says, okay, the last time I had this input of all of these Uh, pieces of interoception, this is what happened. So then the brain is is, is a predictor, actually. It's a black box that's a predictor for us to help us to anticipate what's going on. So it's reading this like interoception. And then that's what is like being, our, our brain is taking that information and it's saying, okay, last time I felt this, this is what happened. And then on top of that, all of the words that we have for emotions, those are also cultural descriptors that we have been handed. And they're actually concepts. It's not like really a thing that's happening. It's a concept that someone taught us, right? You're a little kid, you get butterflies, Mm -hmm. you start to sweat and your family says you're, you're afraid. But another, I mean, in another culture that may not be how they describe fear. In fact, there are like feelings or emotions that we believe are really true here in the U S that other cultures don't have. So we can approach it that way. And we can say, look, all of my emotions are really just concepts. And most of these concepts I developed when I was a little kid. And maybe I want to reevaluate that. And I want to look at what am I feeling? What's the interoception that's happening in this moment? I want to be curious. And I want to decide, maybe those butterflies are like, I'm excited. I got a little sweat in my palms because I'm stoked about what I'm about to do. You know, like I'm going to go give a speech or play a game or do something cool. And so we can, in a way, like reframe. And that's where I think our um, our cognitive capacities can help us to change our emotions, not in a controlling way. But what we can do is we can start to interact with our environment in a new way. And we can say, oh, like I'm setting myself up for situations that feel good and are excited. And I'm creating emotion concepts based on um, things that feel good. And then we also learn to protect ourselves so that we're not in as many traumatic situations, hopefully. So we don't have like that underlying um, uh, like reality. Like we start to phase out that old reality of being highly traumatized Mm -hmm. and we know that we're safe. And so those emotions don't come to the forefront as quickly because now our black empty box and says, okay, well, sometimes it was trauma, but sometimes, you know, being in a whatever situation wasn't. And mm-hmm. we start to build a new, um, uh, like new information for our brain. And that's the only way to rewire, rewire our emotions, actually, is to create new experience, intentionally create new experiences for ourselves. It's not by the, there's no executive part of the brain that's like a reduction of what's really going on. There, but there's no way to like tell ourselves not to have a particular emotion. It's doesn't work. Hmm. The only thing that works is creating these new situations for ourselves where we can create new emotion concepts. So, so how does, 
when we're talking about this, the brain, the emotions, and, you know, we've gone through a pandemic and there's, you know, there's like war going on now and things. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, anxiety, but people sometimes losing their focus, like what to focus on, what to do so much going on around you. And you talk about like the, the focus, right. And being in the flow. How do you get people to maybe talk to them about getting clarity in their life and to be able to get in that flow to reach their greatest potential? So the focus and flow integration came out of a noticing that people were misinterpreting uh, meditation practices. Like as soon as these like Westerners got their hands on them, we made it all about like focus. Like I am going to meditate the F out of this, right? Like I am going to do this. I am going to like use this to become better, right? And like everything, right? Like I'm doing this for a reason. It's like so much tension, so much focus, right? And that's like one mode. But if you think about like how our muscles work, even when like one side of the like limb is contracting, the other side has to be like a little bit like looser in order for that to occur. And so when it comes to like the focus and like the drive and the tension, we're real good at that already. Like we don't need to sit on the cushion and practice that anymore. What we need to do is practice the flip side, the letting it all in, what's here, instead of trying to block out and control, letting what's here be here and to allow that to open, like widen our window to what's going on. So once we do that, then we learn when to push and when to pull, focus and flow. Now what's happening with the collective trauma that we've experienced from the pandemic, um, is a is a related issue but i think that when there's collective trauma anytime there's trauma and healing trauma we need it's like a good apology we need to acknowledge that something happened otherwise it's like when at the beginning of our conversation where we have those feelings or thoughts that just need to be heard and they're going to do whatever they can to be heard um so acknowledging yeah we've been through something really hard and there's been this like collective experience that has been really challenging physically, mentally, emotionally, a lot of uncertainty for a couple of years now. And then in addition to the collective experience, we'll have our own individual experiences throughout this. You know, maybe we've lost dear ones, maybe we've lost a job. And I, my belief is that the only way through this is through a deep acknowledging of it. And, um, and then working with holding people with like grace and tenderness and helping them to express themselves and share what needs to be said. And, um, that's also not an easy fix. You know, and, and John, something else I want you to get your thoughts on of, of this, uh, not just grace, but also, uh, the forgiveness aspect of it. Like so many times we Mm -hmm. feel like we're wrong and we hold these grudges or like in, or we're motivated because people think we can't do something. So we like, we use that as a driving force for our high achieving, but can you talk a little bit about like where forgiveness plays in this and, and taking the weight mm-hmm. off of your shoulders and allowing things to not that you forget what had happened, but you're forgiving in order to help yourself so you can walk in freedom in the future. Like how, like where does that fit in all of this? It sounds like you understand the power of forgiveness. Like, yeah. Um, there is a power in it. And I, it's Buddhist will talk about like acceptance a lot. And I hated that when I first started hearing it, like that's the way it's translated as acceptance. And I'm, I'm a New Yorker. I don't like to, I don't want to accept, right? Like I'm in in charge of my life, you know, like I want things the way I want them and I will work my tail off to get what I want. Like, I'm not afraid of that. So I, after I studied more and practiced more, I began to understand um, another side of this, that it's the choice, right? To, interact with our situation in a way that we want to. And I I feel like that's true for forgiveness as well. Hmm. It's an acknowledgement that something awful happened. Maybe there was a betrayal or some kind of harm that may have been intentional and may not have been intentional, yet the impact really hurt. And so allowing ourselves a moment to say, ouch, and to take care of ourselves in whatever ways we need to take care of ourselves to repair ourselves. And sometimes that requires getting help from somebody else. It may not be the person who did the harm. Usually it's not, right? In fact, usually it's more difficult to try to seek the repair from that person 
because they might not fully understand what's going on or might not want to help us through it. They might feel like they were right. So finding whatever it is that we need for ourselves to heal then allows us to move on from it, to say, okay, that thing happened and there's more to me than that thing. There's more to my life than that thing that happened. And now I'm going to look beyond that thing and I'm going to take maybe a lesson if there is one in this and I'm going to use it for myself in the future. And it's like just that choice of like changing our gaze in a way. Mm. from and the, the way to shift our gaze from the thing to beyond right to our to our future is I, I believe it has to happen through a healing like through the acknowledgement and a repair and then that lets us forgive so we're releasing a, a burden yeah. yeah that's uh and that's what i was curious about because you know so many of us we hold on to things for so long and we don't even realize like over time, we don't even realize it. But then whenever you take a step and reflect, you're like, oh, maybe that's why, you know, I, I feel a certain way because of what had happened. And I just hadn't let like people tend to hold on to things and what people have done to them. And we don't realize it's mm-hmm. like holding us back, not them per se, but our own selves. So like kind of leads to those yeah. heavy weights of, you know, emotional trauma, you know, wrongdoing, that kind of thing. So you can you can move forward. So I just want to get your perspective on that. So, yeah. 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 And I think, Jason, I think there's even more to it than like the individual experience. If that's happening on an individual level, then let's think about all the ways that we're being harmed by like broader like oppressions, like systemic oppression, right? And um, patriarchy and sexism and racism and all these other like little like jabs that are happening to people all day that a lot of people just sort of like, pushed to the side because they're not really aware of it, right? Because that's the way the system is designed so that we don't really fully know what's going on. Um, Or we are aware of it, but it's like, okay, don't pay attention to that, just move on. But all of that is building up in our bodies. And there are a number of books written about this. I mean, My Grandmother's Hands by Resma Menachem, and also The Body Keeps the Score, um, written by a neuroscientist. All those moments are literally building up in our bodies and people used to not believe this but it's true it's like not only in our bodies then we pass it on to our children and our grandchildren so it's really important that we work on these repairs so that humans can express their fullest potential and they're not bogged down by these um stressors that have been building up in us yeah Yeah. and and just to pivot a little bit but you know Mm -hmm. jim and i are always really interested in like intuition that 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 guide inside and how to quiet the analytical side of your brain to think maybe illogically or go with a gut feeling that like hey this makes sense even though everything externally makes like what are you seeing here so is there like do you have a methodology of training intuition of, of building it like a muscle where it becomes stronger and you build that faith of you know seeing what's possible and and following that intuition like can you get talk about that a little bit Yeah, I think this is where like the magic is and the future is really. I mean, we can like Google anything now for the most part, like information is readily available. So what like what's next for humans? You know, it's not about like memorizing things. It's like, how do we find new solutions to problems, creative solutions? How do we see things differently? Um, And I believe that comes from intuition. And so one Thing that anyone can do that I would say if you're interested in developing your intuition are what I call intuition walks. So just walk outside. Um, I wouldn't bring your phone unless you need to. And it's hard at first, but don't have a clear destination in mind. Just let yourself guide you. You feel like going left, go left. You feel like going right, go right. You feel like looping back, do that. And just Walking like that um, is an amazing way to reconnect with intuition. Um, It doesn't happen on one walk. It'll take a a few weeks probably of doing that, you know, daily or every other day to really, you'll notice yourself like softening into the process because at first it'll feel weird. Like we'll want to have a plan. Um, But after a few weeks of doing it, you'll find like greater freedom in a flow of just like flowing with whatever you feel like. That's one thing. A second thing that is helpful for 
making sure that your intuition is like accurate and getting greater precision with intuition is to um, practice predicting things. So something that you have no control over, like the stock market, and just predict, keep a log if it's going to go like, you know, close up or down from the previous day. It could be what you log. And this will help you to um, figure out what the signals are in your body. Like, is it just like anxiety or was it just that I was hungry or, or something? Or was that actually my intuition? So by keeping a log and tracking your, uh, your performance, then you'll start to tune into which signals are actually your intuition and which ones were other other uh, influences that you were picking up on. Those are two fun things. Somebody yeah. was asking, you might ask, uh, can you can you have intuition bike rides? Yeah. I, yeah, that. I don't see why not. I don't see why not. Or yeah. car drives, yeah. It didn't have to be walking. Yeah. It could be other yeah. forms of I, this. I think I like walking or bike rides because there's um, something about being connected to nature that maybe we wouldn't get in a car ride. You mm -hmm. could, if, if cars are the only thing you can do fine, but um, the, the, like the foot on the ground and hearing so much of what's happening in the environment is, um, is helping to hone the intuition because that's Basically, ultimately what we want to be doing. To, uh, like taking your senses, be fully present because you don't have to focus on the road of like other people, that kind of thing. You're able to just be fully present. Yeah. Is that why you recommend walking probably more so? Yeah. Too? It's also yeah. safer. I hear yeah. sometimes too, walking, when you talk about that, like they say walk when you're bare feet, like on grass, on uh -huh. the ground to yeah. get connected. And is that something you suggest too? Because I've heard that like helps connect you with kind of the, the universe and the energy and you know, with your body. Yeah, that's um, a well-known grounding practice. Um, and it's so, it's so wild. Like it's something like, like the, the majority of people around the world do grounding practices, but we just don't do that around here for some reason. Um, How many times practice, as parents we do when you talk about that, I, and I do it as a parent advice, get your socks, get your shoes on. You know, where you run outside without socks and shoes on, right? Right. The, the kids are doing a grounding practice, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. There's another one. Um, I'm sure others do it, but it's a practice that I know from Japan of tree bathing, just like going into the forest or around trees and laying down or sitting and just being mm -hmm. in the trees. They call it tree bathing. And um I think that that's a helpful process for like, it's almost like a filtration um, method, like filtering out a lot of the pollutants and things that we've picked up. There's so much we're picking up on that's interfering with our intuition. And I find especially like electronics mess with my intuition. If I'm doing say a group healing, I have everybody if possible, leave their cell phones like out of the room. If all the phones are in the room, I am um, I can feel like literally feel that uh, like vibration from all the phones. And so I'm highly sensitive. So I'm, I'm noticing it. If you're not as sensitive, you may not notice it, but it's also happening to you. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Hey, something I want to, I want to ask you real quick before we start wrapping up is going back to energy mm -hmm. and a lot of, you know, people have struggled financially, right? Whether it's pandemic, losing jobs, different things, or people stress, or they have maybe a, poverty mentality and things like that. And they always talk about money's energy. It's just a form of energy, right? And if you think a certain way, this energy can flow through you and things like that. How do you help people that maybe have financial blockage that struggle financially and looking for this wealth mentality, this abundance to come in their lives? Is there a way that you work with them on how to help maybe take energy blocks out that are blocking finances, blessings that come in their life? Yeah, that's, it's really common, especially for people who um, are like jumping to new levels where like they are earning a lot more than their parents did or their grandparents did. And so a lot of times what's happening, that limiting belief or that scarcity mindset was ingrained in them, either spoken or just perceived. and. I recognize things in my own life. So my grandparents were alive during the depression, right? Mm -hmm. So there's like this, I still have this like strange scarcity mindset at times, which was passed down from them. But then there's other pieces for me, like being um, the granddaughter of immigrants as well. Like, oh, you know, I, I don't deserve like that one. We're just immigrants, you know, like, so a lot of those beliefs 
are generational or ancestral. And so the work that we could do around that would be energy healing, not so much like talking about it because it's deeper than words. It's on a realm that I call like the pre-verbal. It's like in our bodies, like deeply in our um, unconscious as well as our conscious mind. And so for that kind of work, um, things like Reiki healing are very helpful. And there are Reiki practitioners all over the place, hundreds of thousands of them. Reiki is a form of energy healing and that can be helpful. And then there can also be the practice of like, let's say you don't have access to a Reiki practitioner or that's, you're not into that, being aware of it and like tracking, where did this thought come from? And then comparing it to the reality. So like noticing, okay, this is just like a depression mindset handed down from my grandparents or the idea that like an immigrant doesn't deserve this level of success because that's what my parents said or believed for themselves. And I say, no, the truth is I've worked really hard for this. You know, and then we like apply logic to the situation. I'm living in a different time and place where there are like limitless possibilities. You know, we have the internet, we can do Zoom sessions and reframing it from like kind of a new lens. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, John, this has been a highly insightful uh, podcast. So thank you for joining us. We always like to finish up with the last bit of insight and wisdom from our guests, though, with the four questions of 40 athletes. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, these are, like I said, very short, quick, but. You know, first question is this, in your opinion, what does it mean to win in the game of life? Mm -hmm. To experience um, grace and joy and connection. That's simple, but profound. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. The second question, if you could spend time with anyone you admire in sports, alive, passed away, fictional, non-fictional, who would you pick and why would you choose them? I would love to have a, this could never happen, but I would love to have like a round table with all the athletes I've worked with and just like get time with them and just get to be with them all at once. Now here's my question. Why don't you think that wouldn't happen? Um, well, they're all very busy. That's one oh. thing, but also, um, you know, personalities, they may or not all want to be in the room with each other. No. I don't know. They all have his, their own histories. They well, play against uh, each other or something like yeah, that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Question number three is this, is what is the best advice you ever received from a coach that you've played for, or worked for, or been around? This is someone I worked for who taught me about accountability, the difference between responsibility and accountability, that we can be responsible and take all the steps to, you know, have things turn out the right way, but sometimes they don't turn out the right way. And if they don't, then you're still accountable. Yeah, accountability is, yeah. is key. Taking ownership of uh, what you do in your life. And the last question is, if you had like one, say, character trait or life skill that you could have an individual, maybe you're a coach and you're having them play for your organization or you have your business and, and somebody's working for you, what would that life skill and character trait be and why? Hmm. Just one, huh? I think um, honesty, because I think honesty leads to other things like being in alignment and integrity and you know, honesty about whether or not they actually want to be there doing that job or if they're interested in something else. I think honesty is what I would want in someone. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, honesty is the best policy, they always say, right? So Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, John, you know, how can people learn more about you? Where can they find you on social media, website? Uh, where can they learn more about John? So um, Instagram, I do more on stories than actual posting. So I would say check the stories at Jonna Genova. And my website is jonnagenova.com. Okay, great. Well, John, thanks again for joining us today. It's been a pleasure on our end to have you. Uh, I know Jim and I always, we feel like we are better people afterwards and definitely the case today. I'm going to take my intuition walk after this, Jimmy. With your shoes off to get grounded. Oh, I like that. Hey, you know, that's off. a big deal for me because I always wear socks. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks so much, rest. guys. Yeah, thanks yeah. for coming John, on. Thank you. Have a great thank day. Thank you. You too. Awesome. Well, Jimmy, you know, having a positive attitude in all areas of life is important. And that's why we've given a week free of our 40 Athletes program. But where can they learn more about the rest of our 40 Athletes content? Yeah, you can go to 40athletes.com and see, you know, kind of information we have there. Um, and we talked about, it, Jason, if you're a coach or an administrator and you have an organization, 
Um, you can reach out to us. We can do kind of a discovery call to show you how we can um, work with you and kind of together. And the idea is, again, transforming people's lives through through sports, mm -hmm. but helping them not only win in the sport, but out of sport. Again, the way we talk about is winning in the game of life, which is so important in today's day and age. And they we talk about it. What's uh, mental health crisis that they're declaring right now with everything that's going on. So there's so much that's happened that's going on today in people's minds. And, you know, we talked today, like your thoughts and your mind and that body connection. And so if we can help people understand and have an awareness of it and how they can we talked about today, how they can understand themselves and their mind and be able to have this energy, this healing process to help them be more vibrant and successful in life. That's what we're here for. Absolutely. So, uh, again, that's 40athletes.com. And, Jimmy, again, this is a great episode we had today with John and look forward to more in the future. Jason, as always, I appreciate it. And you take care and have a blessed day as well. Yes, sir. All right, buddy. Take care. Yeah.